Hello, I'm Meliana, welcoming you to another Asian Agribiz podcast. PERS is one of the most economically important pig diseases globally, costing billions of dollars in losses annually. While vaccines are available to manage the disease on farm, the development of a purse resistant pig is one that holds a lot of promise for the industry. Today, Asian pork editor Isa Kiltan talks with David Casey, Asia Product Performance Director at PIC Inc. about PIC's work on the purse resistant pig. How did it come about and where current research is? Will the industry see the purse resistant pig in the market soon? Hello, Dave. Thank you for joining us for this podcast. As we know, disease remains a big, big problem for pig producers the world over. And the development of purse resistant pig is an interesting development. In this podcast, we'd like to get some information, particularly about the purse, the development of a purse resistant pig. And learn more about how it came about, how it's done, and what's in the future for it. So, but maybe before we really get into it, maybe if you could uh, give us a little introduction about yourself. Isa, thank you. It's uh, great to be with you guys today, and I appreciate having me on the program. Uh, My name is David Casey. Uh, I grew up in America, and I grew up on a pig farm. So I've been working with pigs over 35 years. I did my education in America. I got my PhD at Iowa State in genetics. And then after graduating, I started working at PIC. And I've been working at PIC now over 19 years. Uh, The last seven and a half years, I have been based in China and working in Asia. So I've been spending quite a bit of time throughout Asia and understanding this market. So it's great. Great to be with you guys today. Let me start with with this already and and ask you, what has led to the development of the PERS resistant pig? If you don't know (laughs) much about PERS, PERS is a really devastating disease. It causes significant animal suffering and causes billions of dollars in losses in the global pig industry annually. So if we get specific, during a PERS break, 12 to 15% of the pigs die. We get pregnancies mm-hmm. that fail, so we get abortions. Those that live are prone to secondary diseases. So bacterial diseases like mycoplasma then become even more challenging to the system. So if we look at the impact of PERS on the animal, it leads to death or a lifetime of secondary infection. To the farmer, It's a loss of a significant amount of animals and loss of production, also more antibiotic use. And then even from an environmental point of view, PERS can cause a lot more waste and inefficiencies in the system. In research, the estimated impact of PERS to the U.S. industry every year is about 664 million. In the EU, about 1.5 billion euros. Those are two big markets, but if we look at Asia, I mean, half the pigs in the world are in China, and they're still Mm -hmm. around all of Asia. There's a lot of pigs. So the impact of PERS has not been estimated, but it's going to be much bigger than just U.S. and EU numbers. And here's the challenge with PERS. PERS cannot be effectively prevented or even eliminated through traditional veterinarian practices and medicine. The best method is really to keep the virus out of a farm through really excellent implementation of biosecurity practices. But the challenge is that PERS is a highly transmissible disease. So in practice, many farms really struggle to keep it out and stay negative. There are vaccines, but they don't really prevent outbreaks. They just lower the impact of the outbreak. So as an industry, we've really adapted. So we learned how to get a a PERS-positive herd to a PERS-stable herd, where the the impact of the disease is lowered. At PIC, we asked the question, is there a genetic solution to this? Could we create a PERS-resistant pig? So we partnered with multiple universities. 
Uh, very specifically, we partnered with the University of Missouri in America and also with the Roslyn Institute at the University of Edinburgh. In okay. 2015, uh, the University of Missouri published the very first successful results to create a PERS resistant pig. Since okay. that time, multiple universities have done similar research and have backed up that results, including the Roslyn Institute. And also multiple universities in China have verified that exact work. What they found is that they've made the pig completely resistant to the PERS virus, which means that when the pig is exposed to the virus, the virus enters the body, but it doesn't enter the cells and it doesn't replicate. So they're completely resistant. These pigs are not replicating the virus and they're not getting sick by it. So it's complete resistance. So how was it done? What kind of technologies were used to do it? And what were the challenges that the University of Missouri faced in coming up with this resistant pig? Okay. Um, pigs resistant to PERS were developed by making precise changes to the genes through gene editing, what you might commonly know as CRISPR technology. And that, that's the technology that was used. Now, the easiest way to understand CRISPR is you can think of it as a molecular scissors to cut the DNA. CRISPR guides the molecule to a very specific location where you want the cut made. And then Cas9 is the enzyme that actually does the cutting. So this technology allows us to go to a very specific location and to make the cut in the DNA. Now, in the case of PERS, the CD163 gene was edited to remove the binding site for the PERS virus. Now that we know that about CD163, there's really two strategies done in gene editing. One, you can knock it out so that that protein's not expressed anymore, or you could remove the very specific binding site within the protein so that the protein's still there, but the binding site is removed. And then without the binding site, the virus can't attach and can't infect the cell. The, the method that we're using is the latter. You still have CD163 protein, just a small section of the proteins removed so the virus can't bind. Now, what are the challenges? One is to find the receptor protein. The second part is once you find the receptor protein, can you actually find the binding site? So it could really take many years to create and develop a gene-edited pig. It would take years. First of all, to create a gene-edited pig, you'd have mm -hmm. to edit an embryo and grow it up and then test it. So it's going to take multiple years to do. If we're ever going to think about using this throughout the industry, you can't just create one pig and clone it or replicate it and use it across everything. For mm -hmm. sustainability long-term, we need populations with diversity. So you're going to have to edit quite a few animals to maintain a diverse population that you can continue to sustain genetic improvement and maintain normal diversity in populations throughout the world. <laughs> From listening to you, I can understand why despite this technology having been developed in 2015, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. If we're ever going to go to the point where we actually use it in the industry, Okay. In order to ensure confidence and safety for the consumer, there's a lot of research that needs to be done to make sure there's no unintended consequences. For example, we need to ensure it's not going to have any negative consequences to human health. Actually, we, we've created a, a code of ethics before we ever commercialize anything like this that we're going to ensure through research. Um, that there's no un unintended consequences. One, first one is ensure human health. That's the most important. The second, we've got to follow regulatory rules. Uh, we've got to have compliance. This isn't a technology that you can just bring uh, to the market. You've got to go through the regulatory bodies, and that's different for every country. Um, also, we need to make sure that we're making the animals healthier. A change has a negative consequence to the pig, 
whether it's their health or other treats. You got to make sure that you're 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 not getting those things. So we got to make sure it's good for the pig too. So we're going to go through all of that research to ensure um, all of these things are safe before we would ever uh, go to market. But obviously, once you get past all the challenges and the purse resistant pig is developed, there will be a lot of benefits for the industry. So what are these benefits? If you've ever gone through a purse break, it's demoralizing. You know, working in Fairwing during a purse break is just, it's, it's hard on the employees. The negative impact on mortality or, or the animals that live, they're just not healthy. It, it, it's hard on the employees. It's hard on the pigs. That, that's one benefit would be for the people. Uh, but for the pigs, that makes them healthier. Those secondary infections, you know, I, I didn't talk a lot about it. But if you look at mycoplasma is a very common uh, bacterial disease that affects respiratory. By itself has a significant impact in pig farms. But when you put it with PERS, it doesn't, it's not just an additive effect, it's a multiplicative effect. You put those two things together and it's just, it's devastating. It requires quite a, you know, antibiotic use and it really affects performance. So if you just remove PERS, the impact of other diseases or bacteria is greatly reduced, not just a little, a lot. So there's a huge impact there. But think across the industry. Think about the the losses from PERS. If we didn't have PERS throughout Asia, to produce the same amount of pork with the same amount of pigs, we would need a lot fewer farms. If you look about the, the scope, we could produce the same amount of pigs and pork on less land, less resources. The removing that disease would have so many downstream impacts. But to go to a different angle with your question, the PERS resistant pigs will not give any additional advantage beyond just the things that I list. Because of the CRISPR technology, we can very, very specifically change a very small part of the DNA. So the rest of the pig is still the same. It's it's that specific that we're only changing that resistance. The rest of the pig, its growth rate, its reproductivity, its meat, uh, nutritional co- composition of the meat, nothing else has changed. We're creating exact same pig, but just with the resistance. You you really are just, like you said, you're, this is a very specific change that you're making. Nothing else in the pig will change. Exactly. And, that, and, and that's the beauty of this technology is that it allows us to make, make a very small change, but a very impactful one without changing the rest of it. On the long term, do, do, do you see this, having this eventually might eradicate PERS or will the first virus still be there? Well, that's the dream. <laughs> it would be nice <laughs> to say that we could eliminate the disease. But if I put my practical hat on, to go from where we're at today to eradication, there's quite a few steps to get there. So in order to eradicate it, we would have to get it in a lot of populations and get it distributed all over the world to really eradicate it. It, it, it is totally possible, and that would be the, the dream. What would be the path for this technology to find its way into farm production? One of the challenges is that path to commercialization. I mean, a lot of our customers say, hey, we want it. <laughs> we want it too. <laughs> and totally get that. But we, we've got to stick to our ethical commitments to make sure there's no unintended consequence. At PIC, we're first trading in our population as research uh, in America under FDA uh, oversight. Okay. If you look at the FDA process, it's a seven-step process. So the first two steps have already been submitted and and approved. The final FDA package will be finalized right at the beginning of 2024. Um, Now, part of that process is doing, uh, for example, there, there would be four different kinds of experiments that we would have to do. One, we would have to ensure 
what is the phenotypic characteristic of the pig? Is the pig any different other than being disease resistant? So you got to measure things like what is their growth rate? What is their feed efficiency? And is it the same pig as normal? You also have to check to make sure that the pigs really are resistant and that that happens, you know, over time. So you have to challenge them with the disease to make sure they're really resistant and that multiple generations that happen. And Ken, does the resistance pass on from generation to generation? So we have to show that over three generations. And then in that, we also have to do food safety tests. You know, so, so we'll evaluate the pork from gene edited animals, really do a compositional analysis and compare that to, to, to unedited pork. So yeah. that's all part of that process. We're also engaging with different countries, especially markets that we would export from America. So it's, regulatory pathways, you have to consider whether you're going to create domestic production within that country, but you also have to consider meat that's being imported into a country. So there's still a bit of weight, but the wheels are moving and the industry has something to look forward to. But besides spurs, are there efforts to develop pigs that are resistant to other diseases? We okay. are working on it, um, actually in parallel. When we first started with PERS, we were working with different university groups on other diseases. You remember when I talked about the challenges. The, bi the first challenge is finding that receptor in the binding site. That's been the real challenge. So really very specifically, We've been working to trying to find disease resistance to ASF and also swine influenza. Mm -hmm. Those are the two specific diseases that we've been researching. Um, and the challenge is finding those receptor sites. Okay? okay. So the work continues on. The successes haven't come yet. Given that disease resistant pigs are still in the future, what are you doing in genetics to help pigs become, if not resistant, then more robust and resilient to diseases, especially in challenging environments like here in Southeast Asia? This is a great question. So in genetics, everything we've talked to up to this point was is one strategy. In genetics, you could try to create resistance. Uh, there are many other strategies. And what you're talking about is how can we make the pig more robust, more resilient to disease challenges? And there are lots of different efforts being done throughout the industry and at PIC. Um, one, in simple breeding, we often will raise our genetic pigs that we do selection in high health herds. So we raise them in high health herds, we measure their performance, we pick the very best, we choose them to become the parents of the next generation, the next generation is better. But when it comes to health, if we think about it, because they're high health, mortality rates are lower. How do you differentiate which family has the genes to survive better and which ones don't? You really have to put the genetics in a commercial environment, in a conventional health system, and have some disease breaks. And then in those situations, you can then start to see which families or which genes have better results or more robust results. So with that approach, we started a, a, a program where we would, we would create a group of pedigreed pigs, commercial pigs, in a commercial environment. We would measure their performance. So they were exposed to myco, PERS, and, and we would measure mortality. We would measure their growth rate. We'd look at their carcass trait. And then we've been using that data then to differentiate which families had the good genes and which ones didn't. And through that process and many years, we've been seeing our mortality rate, uh, our genetic trend has really been improving. There's also been work in resilience. A resilient pig will get exposed to a virus. They'll still get sick, but a resilient pig will, will get rid of the virus quicker and get on with it. So the impact of it will be less. We continue to look in those areas. We continue to select. Uh, put pigs in commercial environment and just select a more robust one. But it's very important, like you said, to not just do all this work in a controlled environment. It has to be done in a real setting. Exactly. We have to be creative 
and be able to put our genetics in these commercial environments and measure it. Every year we have about 200,000 pigs born into that program, pedigreed pigs that we're measuring uh, in a commercial environment. So you, you have to do it sizably. You can't do it small. And, and to your point, you know, for many years, we were challenged by our customers. Hey, you show us these wonderful genetic trends. That's great. You see it in your farm, but we don't always see it in our farms. And they were right because there were different environments. We, we have to get into that commercial environment to be able to create the real improvement that they see and realize. So let me just um, round this up. PIC is working towards coming up with uh, disease-specific resistant pigs, but there's still so much work that needs to be done. That, that's, a, that's a great way to put it. Um, we've been very open with the industry about the research um, and, and the steps to bring it to commercialization. Everyone is very excited, but we will do that in an ethical way and be, do it in a transparent way. And we continue to research new avenues, new technologies of how, how we can do this. Well, Dave, thank you so much for taking time to answer some of my questions today. I learned a lot from you, and um, <laughs> I'm sure our listeners will do as well. It was my pleasure to be with you today. As you have heard, the wait for a commercially available first resistant bee continues, but the wheels are turning and the future is promising. Thank you for listening in. For more on the Asian animal protein industries, please visit www.asian-agribiz.com. This is Meliana inviting you to join us in our future podcast.